we call lost and found forgotten fragments of Czech Jewish history. Uh, special event uh, because as you all know, uh, we commemorate Yom HaShoah. Uh, Yom HaShoah uh, in English, Holocaust Remembrance Day or, or Holocaust and Heroism Remembrance Day, which is observed as Israel's day of commemoration for the approximately six million the Jews who perished in the Holocaust as a result of the actions carried out by Nazi Germany and its collaborators. And as you know, the Jewish uh, community was a very important part of uh, society in Czechoslovakia, Democratic Republic, which, which was founded uh, in 1918. And exactly 20 years later, tragic events of September 1938 in Czechoslovakia remind us how everything can change overnight. Uh, Czechoslovakia was a country that had much in common with uh, the European democracies of all our own time. It was far from perfect, but uh, it had fully functioning democratic institution made up by the rule of law. And there was a thriving uh, pluralist press. All this was sustained by a belief that uh, there were certain basic internationally recognized diplomatic rules. And when uh, Adolf Hitler uh, decided to ignore these rules and uh, Czechoslovakia's allies allowed him to do so, the result was catastrophic. Britain's Prime Minister Chamberlain uh, arrived uh, back in London as a national hero after signing the Munich Agreement. But uh, as he addressed uh, the jubilant crowds and the Heston Aerodrome, he didn't mention Czechoslovakia once nor did he mention the tens of thousands of Jewish Czechoslovak citizens who suddenly found themselves living on German territory under the Nuremberg racial laws. And not only was Central Europe's last democracy shattered instantly, but Britain's moral and diplomatic authority was compromised to such an extent that we feel its consequences to this day. And uh, it's my honor to welcome my special guest as well tonight, uh, my friend, former colleague, uh, David Wagen. David, welcome. Hello, it's a pleasure to be with you from Prague this evening. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased uh, that you're my host today. As uh, I can say, it, uh, you're a journalist who work in BBC and now works in the Czech National Radio where we met about 20 mm. years ago, I would say. Yeah. And uh, I would just to say a few words about David. Uh, he has written extensively uh, about the role of uh, the media in uh, 1938 crisis in making the unthinkable possible. And we will be talking to him about these events, but also talk about the impact on one particular Czech Jewish family, the Wells family. So David, please, um, first question. How did you uh, firstly get interested in the events around 1938? Well, Robert, thanks very much for that <laughs> introduction. <laughs> it's really wonderfully comprehensive introduction, so we know what we're going to be talking about. I became interested, I've been involved in one way or another with uh, Czech radio, previously Czechoslovak radio, for 30 years, ever since really immediately after the fall of, of communism. And uh, I gradually realized over the first few years that the radio had this incredible and has this incredibly rich sound archive, which had survived you know, all the dramas of 20th century Czech history. And um, particularly, uh, particularly interesting was the archive between about 1936 and the end of 1938, where there were literally hundreds and hundreds of, of recordings preserved. And these were recordings of not just in Czech, but also in other languages, in English, German, French, all sorts of different languages. And also they weren't just recorded, they're mainly recordings from Czechoslovak radio, but they weren't just Czechoslovak radio, but also recordings from uh, presumably how they had been monitoring other radio stations at the time here in Prague. Uh, and so, and as I listened, I became more and more drawn in and, and it was very strange because as I listened to these recordings, I, it, it was a very strange experience because uh, you were, you're really, uh, you, you're hearing uh, the events as people would have heard them on air at the time. 
you hear the voices of the actors, you know, the main actors in the drama uh, that was going on at that time. You hear their every breath, you hear their mood, you hear, you, you, you can sense, you know, the, the tension. And, um, and that's really how it all began. And I realized as I, as I sort of went more deeply into the, the events of the time, that this was the first, that the, the, the Munich crisis and the Anschluss of Austria just before it, that this was the first major international diplomatic crisis where the electronic media played a, you know, a, a key role and that radio was, was right there in, in, in the middle of it. And, and it meant that each event, because radio is, it, 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 it reaches a lot of people, millions of people potentially instantaneously, it meant that uh, the suddenly the pace of diplomacy had accelerated tenfold and, and uh, things like that's public that's opinion were constantly shifting as the latest news came, came, came through. It was, it was a complete, it was a shift that you can really compare with the uh, arrival of today's social media, I think. Uh, as, as you said, uh, uh, the Czechoslovak radio, radio itself, played an absolutely central role. Um, in what ways could you could you say could you describe it? What ways? Actually? Well, Czech, I mean, Czechoslovakia uh, was was quite a pioneer in terms of, of broadcasting, and I mean, really, as uh, as you know, uh, Robert, I mean, the radio. Anybody who works in, in Czech radio today know, knows that they're building on a huge tradition that goes back really to the very early days of radio in the early 20s. And, and there was a lot of very good radio out there. Uh, and it's very interesting that, um, for example, I mean, President Masaryk, even though he was born way back in 1850, he was... Um, he was passionate about, he loved gadgets, he loved new technology. He was very, very enthusiastic about radio. Uh, there's also one interview, amazing interview, where he sort of predicts the invention of the internet. <laughs> he talks about how we'll be able to communicate with, you know, simultaneously with people in the other ends, opposite ends of the world. And what I can do now, maybe I'll play us a, a very short extract uh, of, from, President Masaryk talking in 1932, uh, and he's talking about broadcasting. Uh, so hopefully this will work. Let's have a look. Um, share screen. Technical progress is continually placing new means at our disposal. One of them is broadcasting, which is becoming one of the most popular bonds of union among the nations, as well as one of the most suitable instruments for the spread of culture and art and of political education. The spread of broadcasting is a direct document of progress and sense for education and culture. It's really amazing to, to listen to uh, the, Tomáš Garik Masaryk, our first president, president of independent Czechoslovakia, the Democrats, democratic Czechoslovakia. Uh, it's been recorded uh, almost 80 years ago. It's, mm. it's really amazing. I, 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 would, I would say that uh, uh, Masaryk actually was the first head of state who uh, visited uh, Palestine, the, uh, the British mandate Palestine uh, in 20s, in 1920s, and when he visited uh, Jerusalem. Uh, but uh, get back, David, uh, how, how did things uh, change when uh, Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany the same, same year, same year as uh, this uh, Masaryk speech was recorded? Yeah, in fact, it's just a, a year later, but it's uh, uh, it's interesting because you can see there that it's it's a little bit like in the early days of the internet that Masaryk sees broadcasting, he sees the positive side of it. You know that this is a tool for education and spreading culture and communication, and it's exactly the same sort of message that we get from um, from Einstein. In fact, when he opened the international radio exhibition in Berlin in 1930, he was incredibly positive and optimistic about the future. Uh, 
And then, of course, in January 1933, the Nazis came to power in Germany. And um, I mean, Goebbels was brilliant. I mean, he, he, he realized instantly the huge potential. I mean, even back in 1933, Goebbels talks about radio being being as, as effective as, a, as, 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 a, as the airplane, as a, as a tool in the, the so-called German revolution. And, and so what, I mean, what, what, uh, what Goebbels started doing was, was uh, making all the media, and in particular radio, and he invested a huge amount of money as well, state money into the radio, uh, making it serve the German revolution. Uh, and uh, very much on the on the Führer principle, you know, the the, the, the principle of, of everything serving the, the the Führer, serving the ideas of the Führer. Uh, this doesn't just mean that they were broadcasting propaganda all the time. They were broadcasting. He was actually very aware that you have to entertain. That you're, if you're going to be en broadcasting endless Hitler speeches, people are going to get bored. And so it was it was very clever. It was very sophisticated. And it was constantly building on these truths and half truths. And I mean, I suppose the um, then I mean the, the question arises: What does a democratic country do to to respond to that uh, when 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 it's being bombarded with 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 disinformation in this way? And um, what Czechoslovak radio did, they were quite slow actually to realise the threat. But they 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 responded with this kind of reasonableness, the idea that you know the only way you can the, the, for a democratic country to to resist this is but through through reasoned argument. In fact, as we know, reasoned argument really often isn't enough in these times. But I can play you another um, I can play us another little extract from from Masaryk, which is from just after. The Nazis have come to power, and you can see how how very sort of modern and reasonable he is in his perception. He's talking about Europe, and um, uh, again, he's talking very much in the language of a, of, of a modern uh, politician, democratic politician of our own time, and it's such a contrast with the with the rhetoric of of of, of Hitler. Here it is. I am happy to remember that our Bohemian King George in the 15th century tried to organize a pan-European league for international peace. There can, of course, be no doubt that political difficulties and crises are to a certain extent rooted in economic difficulties, just as, on the other hand, Economic difficulties and crises are influenced and graduated by political difficulties. I am convinced that here, too, it is mainly a matter of how to return to international solidarity and collaboration. Cooperation with Europe, all people of goodwill must get together to work towards the ultimate ideal, which means not only to get out of the present crisis, but also prepare the absolutely necessary atmosphere for lasting peace. There are a great many unsolved problems in the troubled world of today, but we must settle them in friendly and honest discussion, for they won't be solved by bombing cities and killing innocent women and children, we need confidence to each other instead of poisonous gases. The cooperation of America is extremely important, and I expect from the two Anglo-Saxon countries to do their share. The times of any thoughts of splendid isolation are over. We are all in the same boat. So. I find it absolutely fascinating to. It's still still true, you know, like now what nowadays, you know, it's mm. still. And the way that he talks, that he warns, you know, Britain and America, and that the splendid isolation is 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 never going to work. He's and it, 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 it's it's such a contrast with the world of 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 
neighbor, you know, of, of Hitler and Goebbels, Germany next door, 1933. And it's fascinating, as you say, when you think that, that Masaryk at that time, he was born in 19, 1850, so he was 83, 83 at that time. So it's taking us back 170 years, isn't it? Uh, it quite extraordinary um, that how, how, how modern he is, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we, we saw that the, the Masaryk, uh, when we talked together, you mentioned an English journalist, uh, Edgar Young, who visited the, the Sudetenland in 1937. Mm -hmm. Co confirm, you know, what, what, what were you talking about a couple of minutes ago about Hitler, yeah, like like Apples, about all the propaganda. So. Mm. Well, what I mean, what really what happened in the course of the of the 1930s was that that um, Czechoslovakia under unfortunately underestimated the need to broadcast in German to its own citizens, given that nearly a quarter of Czechoslovakia's citizens were were German speaking or German was their first language, and uh, unfortunately they only broadcast for years. They were only broadcasting about half an hour a day in German, and so people who were German speakers or who were living in the borderlands close to to, 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 to Germany and Austria, they would um, they would tune in to either Vienna or to Berlin, and um, Goebbels took advantage of this, and so what happened was that there was this, this um, really quite, as I say, quite good radio. It was very modern, it was entertaining radio with this undercurrent of, of, um, of the ideology of the time, and also with a strong undercurrent, undercurrent of anti-Semitism, which was, which was sort of ever present there. And, um, and Czechoslovakia only really realized when it was when it was too late. I'm I'm not saying that they could have changed history because I mean the the, the, the this great wave of military and propaganda might of Germany would have been very very hard to resist. But there is uh, I can play us another little uh, recording from a British journalist, as you mentioned, Edgar Young, who was uh, who was a a British journalist, a left-wing British journalist. He was also uh, at one point a member of uh, a member of Parliament for the Labour Party. He came to the Sudetenland, uh, and uh, he travelled around. This was at the uh, uh, on the end of 1936 and 19, the beginning of 1937, and he made uh, he gave a talk. And I'll just play a very short extract from what he says because again, I think it's something that's uh, that's uh, very relevant to our own time. Czechoslovakia is known to most foreigners, largely, if not entirely, through the propaganda of her enemies. The Czechoslovaks are only now beginning to realize the dangerous effects of the new technique of propaganda, which consists in telling lies and half-truths with such conviction and consistency that even the victims begin to wonder what is really the truth. They have yet to devise an effective counter to it. And in the meanwhile, it would be a good thing if more foreigners were to visit the Republic to see for themselves how things are and to tell their countrymen the plain truth. I find that particular quote where he talks about, you know, repeating lies and half-truths with such conviction and so often that they become true. I mean, it just reminds us that, you know, when we talk about this post-truth post world, yeah, I just living in, it, was the, it was exactly the same then. There is no difference. They were, that was, this was the same kind of, of post-truth. I've left this image on the screen uh, because that's another thing about about what that was so radically new about radio and it was so dangerous when radio was in the wrong hands is that what this poster says it's an advertisement for Marconi radio Marconi radio sets but it says uh, radio uh, knows no borders and you can see it's like a very modern image of a train going through across different countries and of course that's a very positive image but of course this flip side of that is that propaganda also suddenly with the emergence of radio also knows no no borders so it was a, a very much a, a double-edged sword and, I mean, and and that was I mean that was that was a terrifying thing at the time you know that that people would there was a British journalist called Sidney Morell who traveled around Czechoslovakia and traveled around the borderlands and he said that he would go to places where 
people knew what the situation was like on the ground. They knew that they that the, 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 the Czech Czechoslovak state wasn't a terror regime and it wasn't murdering its own citizens, but they were hearing it on the German radio and therefore believing it against the evidence of their own eyes, which I find absolutely fascinating and, 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 and very, very frightening. And that's, that's, that was, uh, there was really the beginning of a discourse, a discussion about how on earth is that possible? And of course, nothing new under the sun. I mean, when, you know, in recent, in the last few years, we've been talking about it as if it's something completely new. And it was, it was all already in place way back then. Uh, this, this reminds me actually, you know, recently nowadays we see the social media, you know, uh, they impact, you know, exactly, you know, if you repeat all the lies, you know, they become true. So it's actually the same with social media, you know, 21st century, like it was with radio and uh, uh, almost a hundred years ago. Uh, and they were the, so what happened next? What happened after you, after this yeah, crisis and uh, where? Well, it's, I mean, it's just very, very interesting because I mean, by the, by, by 1937, 38, it was clear that, that Hitler had territorial ambitions, first of all, for Austria, then for Czechoslovakia, that he, that, you know, that he was uh, sooner or later uh, going to cross the borders. And, um, he used uh, the media in a very, very clever and a very frightening way in that um, um, he would actually, I mean, I can give two examples. Um, one of them is uh, from the 12th of September, 1938, when um, he gave a speech at the party rally in Nuremberg, which was broadcast live to, uh, to the Sudetenland, to the Czech, borderlands and it was basically uh, an appeal for an uprising it was it was a call for the germans of czechoslovakia to stand up and it did i mean over that evening immediately after his speech ended there was an uprising in, in about a dozen different towns in the german, mainly german speaking towns in czechoslovakia which was actually put down by the by the, the czech police and the and the perpetrators they sort of fled to the across the border but it was a very direct use of 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 the of the new media in a, as a, as a kind of that kind of that way of combining propaganda with creating realities on the ground which of course you know we see a, a lot in, in, in our own time a second example which is absolutely um fascinating is the day that neville chamberlain the british prime minister met hitler in the, in the, you know hitler's retreat in berchtesgaden um suddenly that morning on the radio on the german radio that the only story was that 300 unarmed Sudeten German civilians had been murdered, massacred by Czech police. In fact, it was it was not even an ounce of this wasn't even a half truth. It was a it was a completely invented piece of news. But when Hitler met Chamberlain, and this is actually in Chamberlain's diary, the first thing Hitler said, uh, Chamberlain said, "Well, I've got an agenda. These are the things I think we should talk about." And Hitler said to, to, to Chamberlain, "We can't talk about any of these things." Because there is this, this this new event which has changed the reality on the ground, and we can't possibly allow our you know, German citizens to be or German German nation um, people of German nationality or identify themselves as Germans to be massacred, uh, uh, and just uh, and just not talk about that. And so and and, and the Chamberlain said, okay. So Hitler had set the agenda on the basis of a news report on the radio, which was invented, and of course it was all very very carefully set up. So, so um, the media played this very big, big role. I mean, that's not, and it's not just in Germany. I mean, in Britain, Chamberlain was actually was well was. Uh, unfortunately, he was he was a he was very media savvy, and um, he didn't really want to have too there to be too much debate about his policy of appeasement. Mm. And he did, yeah, and he did kind of, and he bullied the uh, the BBC into. He didn't. He, he he was clever. He didn't make turn the the BBC into a propaganda tool. He couldn't have done that. There would have been too much resistance. But he just uh, he blocked, banned discussion programs about the issues behind 
the Czechoslovak crisis or the Austrian crisis. And, that's, uh, and that eff effectively meant that people in Britain were very, very badly informed about what was going on in Central Europe. Whereas in America, there weren't these restrictions and the American journalists, by contrast, people like uh, Ed, Edward R. Murrow or Bill Shiro, who became legendary broadcasters, they sort of came in and, and um, they realized, hey, the, the Anschluss of Austria and the Munich crisis, this is a great story. Let's go in and start sending reports. The technology had just really caught up with, 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 with this sort of ambition. So they could actually send live reports to, to New York and, 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 and Chicago and wherever. And, they, and so the American public was being bombarded with the latest news from, from Europe. Whereas in Britain, for example, there was very little, um, very little news coming out of Czechoslovakia. It's very, very, it's a very interesting situation. And Czechoslovak, but Czechoslovak radio tried hard to to counter uh, the, the propaganda the Germans. The they did try hard. They tried. They were very cautious at first. They didn't want to rock the boat, and they were concerned um, uh, about uh, about sort of. And it's it's hard to say actually what what the leadership of the radio was so was so scared of but they were very cautious and, and it was only very gradually that in in especially in the course of 1938 that I mean some of the top Czech radio journalists people people like uh Franta Kotsorek or Miroslav Dizman they you know names who are you and I instantly recognize the legends of Czech radio uh they started broadcasting these these brilliant reports you know sort of saying you know this is what's going on and 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 as as the crisis reached a peak, uh, there there really was uh, um, there were some incredibly powerful talks that were broadcast on 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 radio. I mean, the on the very night that the Munich Agreement was signed, which, which basically meant the end of Czechoslovakia as it was, uh, there was a brilliant report by the historian, the Czech historian Jan Slavik. Uh, saying, you know, Germany is talking about self-determination of peoples, uh, but how can they do that when they're talking about master races and, and un, you know, untermenschen? Uh, and this was on the very same day that Munich was signed. It's very, it's very moving. It's very moving when you hear these things. And these are all, you know, it's recordings that are all in the, the Czech the Czech radio. Well, well, we're talking about so, uh, what is the legacy of Munich in uh, media terms? <laughs> well, I mean, in in um, the legacy of 1938, in in terms of of what radio, how radio news works, is enormous, because the the two days after the the, the uh, Hitler marched into Austria, the Anschluss of Austria, um, the, the 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 Colombian, the CBS. American radio network did the first ever news roundup, world news roundup. It's the first time that anybody ever done it, where they where they went to different capitals around Europe, saying, "What's the situation? How are you responding to what's happening in Austria?" That was the beginning of modern radio and TV news, and and uh, in that way, it was you know this was really a, a milestone. In other ways, I mean, in terms of the BBC, it was very damaged by 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 the the fact that it had become so subservient to Chamberlain, but it did bounce back very quickly. Um, and uh, in the course of the Second World War, I mean, the, BB, the one thing that the BBC realised is that uh, uh, telling lies, <laughs> broadcasting propaganda, saying that things are better than they are, is often counterproductive. So the BBC was astonishingly honest during the Second World War about when things were going wrong, and it worked. It meant, meant that it kept people's trust, and in and in um, in Czechoslovakia, tragically, I mean, everything fell apart. I mean, after Munich, really, there is so little of the old, you know, lively, vibrant Czechoslovak radio radio journal that was there before, and and there were also there was all this horrible pressure from Germany. You know, for example, for example, Jewish people, journalists working in, in, in the radio were gradually being marginalized and removed. And this was even before the beginning of the occupation as the pressure from Germany was so enormous. A very, very, very sad episode.
and um, you know, I think in the in the years of after the war of the of the, the communist regime, sadly, you know, part of that legacy survived. Although, as you know, Robert, I mean, um, even under communism, there was some very very good radio coming out of uh, out of Czech, 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 Czechoslovak radio, and and the radio and, and the American. I mean, and, and for the Americans, just to, to wind it all up, for the Americans, it was the beginning of a of a really uh, the golden days of, of, of radio news. I mean, they, they realized they realized that news sells, you know, because they were all, it was all commercial broadcasting in the States. And they realized, hey, these are dramatic times we're living through. News sells. We can do all this. We've got the technology to make radio bridges all over the world. Let's do it. And um, to this day, I mean, you know, the American, the American electronic media is, yeah. is very dynamic, you know, compared to yeah. similar process yeah. so it's a big so i think that i, th I think the 1938 really was an absolutely uh, a, a key moment in in the history of the media i mean that's really uh, okay so now before before we, we move to our forgotten fragments of czech jewish history oh yes the most family I would just uh, you know uh, to say a few words to our audience if you have any questions of course you can write down on our facebook uh so we will answer, try to answer your questions. So uh, be free, write anything you want to ask for. <laughs> we try to, to, uh, to answer. Uh, so you have also researched, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, into the history of one uh, particular Czech family whose uh, fate was directly influenced by the events of uh, that tragic year in 1938. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the family, uh, the family we're talking about is the Vels family, which uh, was in many ways, they were a, they were a typical Prague middle class family. They were, they were Jewish, but not particularly observant. They were, um, Rudolf Vels was a successful architect. His wife was, uh, Ida was from um, uh, the town of of Cheb or Eger near the Bavarian border and uh, her native tongue was German. And that was also very typical for Prague Jewish families between the wars that uh, they were bilingual. Uh, and, and, they had, um, and they had two sons uh, who were called Martin and, and Tomasz. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to, to the particulars of, the, of 1938 in a minute because the two boys wrote this rather amazing book at the end of 1938 which I'll talk about in a minute but maybe I could uh, uh, just give to give you an idea of what the family was like uh, there I, I can show you a few slides okay. um, let's see if this will work can you now see that Hopefully you should now see a, a letter in German. Yeah, we do. That's fantastic. This is uh, Rudolf. I mean, Rudolf Vels was born in the um, in the 1880s in a, in a Czech village in a West Bohemian village called Osek, not far from Pilsen, Pilsen, the town that's famous for its beer. And uh, he uh, was a very very talented young man. And his father, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later, Shimon was. Uh, very eager for him to get a good education. And um, he ended up studying architecture in Vienna. Uh, and he, uh, after his initial studies, he went on to, to, study, to study and to work under um, Adolf Loos, who is you know, one of the legends of uh, uh, really European architecture in the uh, uh, first half of the 20th century in Vienna. He had, he had set up his own unofficial uh, School of Architecture. Uh, many of his students were Jewish, and several of them, like Paul Engelmann, for example, or, or, or Kurt Unger, ended up in Palestine and then building, um, you know, in in Israel uh, after the, the state of Israel was founded, and and had a sort of second life. Uh, and um, tragically, that wasn't the case with with uh, Rudolf. And this is just a letter that uh, confirms that he is working for Adolf. Adolf Loos. This is uh, in 1913, November 1913, just before the First World War. 
And uh, Rudolf was not only a, a very talented architect, he was also very gifted uh, as a draftsman and as, as an artist. And this is a drawing, for example, that he did when he was still a student, because Adolf Loos was notorious for not liking drawing. He didn't draw himself, he got his students to draw for him or his colleagues. And so this is a design by Adolf Loos, which was drawn up by uh, Rudolf. Uh, and um, it's for a, a, a department store in Alexandria in, in Egypt, which was never realized, but it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful uh, architectural drawing and, and Loss liked it so much that he had it in his, his hanging in his living room. This is, um, this is Rudolf and his wife, uh, Ida. They, they met when he was injured in the First World War. He was conscripted being an Austro-Hungarian citizen and he was injured and uh, he met this very handsome young woman working who was volunteering as a nurse in, um, in, in Heb, where she came from, and they met and they got married. And this is uh, Rudolf and, and Ida in 1917, back in Vienna. Uh, Rudolf was injured, and so that was, to his great relief, he wasn't sent back to the front. Uh, and there's actually a letter that survives where he talks about, you know, what's it all about? You know, as so many people from Austro-Hungary were, you know, com were, were conscripted and were fighting for a cause they didn't believe in. And he was, I think, very relieved to have been invalided out. He, uh, as, a, as a young man, as a young architect, he was, very he, he was very idealistic. And I think he built on that idealism from his experiences of the First World War as well. This is a design for a, for a, a garden city for children. He traveled also to Britain and in, before the First World War and saw the garden cities in, in Britain. And this, for example, is uh, the, the, the synagogue in the garden city for children. There was a synagogue, a Catholic church and a Protestant church all next to one another, next to one another. Uh, and this was going to be a, a, a sort of home for children, for orphans uh, of First World War veterans. Uh, as you can see, very idealistic. And the architecture is sort of very much, you know, Vienna of the time. And then after the war, after the, at the end of the First World War, he came back to, 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 to Bohemia. Uh, and of course, by that time it was Czechoslovakia. And he started um, working in the town of Sokolov in uh, Western Bohemia. Uh, and this is one of his first buildings. This is a school that he designed in, uh, in Sokolov with a very, very interesting staircase. Uh, he also, inspired by um, the uh, the British uh, Garden City movement, he designed also estates. So uh, this is a miners' village in Falkenau or Falknov or Sokolov. Uh, here it is as it looked then. Uh, still standing, but has, has changed a lot. All the windows have changed, and people have added bits to their houses. But I think he would not have minded that. Um, and this was, and and he was working. He was getting a lot of commissions from the from from the Czechoslovak from the new Czechoslovak state. Uh, I think he had. An, it was one of the rare advantages, actually, where I think that his being Jewish was actually an, an advantage because he he had studied in 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 Austria. He spoke German, but he, Czech was his mother tongue, and he was not. And there was so much polarization, sort of, in terms of the, the, especially in terms of the the German population of the borderlands, many of whom didn't want to be part of Czechoslovakia, that I think it was one of those rare occasions where it was actually an advantage to be Jewish. And um, this is the miners house that he designed, um, uh, which is his best known building. It's enormous, it's in Sokolov. It dates from 1923 to 1925. He also designed the Freeze, which is a day in the life of a miner. He was very much a socialist. He was a social democrat. In fact, there's a rather interesting combination of, uh, or there are two busts that were originally in the building next to one another. One was of Marx and one was of President Masaryk, which is quite a, a, a rare combination and it's interesting. Um, and, he was, and he became very successful. That's a section across the building. Uh, again, showing his, it shows a little bit, you can see a little bit here, the influence of Adolf Loos with his with lots of changes of level which is something that, uh, that uh, was very much from the school of Adolf Loos. And Rudolf also designed um, glass, beautiful, one beautiful work. I mean, this is, and it was for the, for the uh, Moser, 
the famous Moser glass manufactory in, um, in Karlsbad, in Karlovy Vary, which of course is still going strong. Uh, here's one, here's another. This is his Animor series, the animals. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, and nice, it's rather nice that uh, uh, Moser have started again making uh, glass to these, to, to Rudolph's designs. Uh, he built a huge amount in, in Karlsbad, in Karlovy you know, it was a thriving spa town. This is his design, or this is his uh, uh, spa number six, known as the, the gas spa uh, at the time. Uh, rather a wonderful building, um, unfortunately demolished in 2006. It was very neglected, but uh, most of his other buildings do still stand. This is his, uh, one of the, another of his most interesting buildings is with this very clever way that because it's on a very steep slope the way he's done the staircase which is very inspired by Adolf Laws. This was the retirement, the Jewish retirement home in Karlsbad uh, and the building uh, still stands and it's now actually home to the to the uh, the Jewish community of Karla Vivare uh, and there's also a synagogue in there uh, and um, there's a very moving or, or horrible description of, of this building just after Hitler annexed the Sudetenland, where uh, um, an American journalist who's traveling through describes how every room is empty. You know, where have, the, where have all the old people gone? Well, we know where they ended up. Very, none of them survived. Um, and there are swastikas in every window. Uh, you know. uh, this is another building by um, Rudolf in Carlo Vivari. Again, it's got a taste of, of Chicago, you know, this, this clinker walls. That's what it looks like today. It's been beautifully renovated, renovated actually. Very modern, you know, this is the early 1930s. Uh, it's got these, uh, these um, sash windows, which would say, were considered very modern at the time, and this clinker walls, and it was a, it's a, it's a, it was designed as a, as a the health insurance headquarters for for, for West Bohemia, uh, and that's the family, you know, this happy, successful family. That's uh, Rudolf and the two, the two boys, uh, Tomas or Thomas and Martin. There are the two boys, Thomas and Martin again. Here they are, uh, the whole family. This is Ida uh, on holiday in, the, on, in Binz on the Baltic coast of Germany in 1930, approximately 1930. Um, and I find it very moving looking at these photos because of the family, only, um, only Tomasz survived. And then they moved to Prague um, in 1933. And uh, this is the building that they lived in in Prague from 1935 until they were made to move out by the the, 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 the occupation authorities during the during the war. Um, this is a building that was designed by Rudolf. They lived in the top flat with this wonderful terrace, which uh, must have been. Uh, there are some photos of the interior of the flat as well. It must have been a wonderful flat, and um, and uh, Rudolf went into partnership with another architect who was uh, who was also Jewish, uh, also bilingual, uh, called uh, Guido Lagos, and they uh, their office was here, again in a building just off Wenceslas Square designed, that they designed, the Alpha Arcade, uh, and um, they designed a whole load of buildings in Prague in the, in the sort of mid and late 30s, and they also worked with the film industry, uh, most famously on the wonderful film called Hey Rope, which means Heave Ho, made by Martin Fritsch in 1934, starring uh, Voskovets and, and Verich, the two great uh, act, comic actors and cabarettists of, of, of the time. Uh, and uh, they, they, they worked as architects on this film and on several other films. This is from another film from the from the mid thirties. Again, I mean, fantastic. What a wonderful, what a wonderful space. And, uh, and so the family was, was, was really thriving. And um, these are some of the buildings that they designed in Prague. Uh, very solid, very well-designed um, 
apartment blocks. Uh, I think they, they, you know, they, they, they've moved a little bit away from, from Rudolf's and, and Lagos's um, socialist ideals, because these were quite sort of luxury apartment blocks. <laughs> this particular one is just round the corner from where I am now sitting. Uh, it's a fantastic building. There's one thing that is very, very moving uh, about when, when you think about this building is that it's just about 50 meters from the so-called radio market. Uh, which is the place where during the, the German occupation where Jews were made to gather before being sent by train from Bubni station, which is just around the corner, to the Theresienstadt or Theresien ghetto. So, and, and that includes the Wells family. So Rudolf Wells and his wife and younger son, they would have actually been made to wait for three days within sight of one of his best buildings before they were sent to the ghetto. It's a, a horrible thought. Um, this is another building that he designed. This building is in Paranova. It was also actually Vyacheslav Nezval, the poet, also lived in that building at one time, which is another nice connection, one of the great Czech poets. This is the family. You know, they're, they're, you know, this is Ida and the two boys. It's, just, it's very, very moving looking at these pictures. This is in, as you can see at the bottom there, 1938, so it's just before everything was turned upside down. This is in Letna Park, just around the corner from where they lived, and here are Rudolf and Ida walking down Narodni Trida, the National Avenue in the, in the heart of Prague. Um, they, <clears throat> in the autumn of, of 1938, uh, they applied immediately after uh, the Munich Agreement was signed and they applied for a visa to, to, to emigrate. They realized that things were going very seriously wrong. And um, tragically, I mean, this is the letter that they received six months later. You can see it's dated the 22nd of March, 1939. Uh, that's a week after the beginning of the German occupation of Bohemia and Moravia. It's a letter from the American embassy. I don't know if you can read it from there, but it's it's basically saying that they're rejecting their application for a visa or postponing it indefinitely in this horribly dry bureaucratic language. Uh, and that proved, of course, in the end to be, to be uh, a death sentence for the family. Only their son, um, uh, Tomáš survived and he, he escaped a month later, uh, smuggled himself across the border to Poland, which was not yet occupied. Uh, so Second World War hadn't yet broken out. And then from Poland, he managed to get to Britain as a refugee and uh, he served in the, in, in the Royal Air Force in the Second World War. Um, the rest of the family were trapped in Prague. They were sent in 19, at the beginning of 1942 to Terezin, to Theresienstadt, and then uh, they were murdered in the so-called family camp in Auschwitz in March uh, 1944. These are the, uh, the Stolpersteine, so-called the little memorial plaques in the pavement in front of their house, in the house that I just, uh, showed you uh, just around the corner from here again um, and so uh, yeah so it's just a, 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 a well exactly four yeah. weeks ago I just, yeah, the yeah. and so that's I mean that's uh, that's in a that, that that's really a bit, a bit of information about the about the the, the family and um, and and then there's and then there's this amazing book which which yeah. The, the two sons, you Sancta saw Familia. Yeah, Sancta Familia. I mean, basically they had, they had uh, the Wells, Rudolf and Ida had these two boys who were both very bright and very lively. And, uh, um, and this book actually dates from the time between their having written that letter, applying for a, a visa to emigrate to the United States and the beginning of the occupation when they were trapped. They wrote it for, Christmas 1938 they were a Jewish family but like most Jewish families in Prague they also celebrated Christmas at the time and um, and uh, this uh, the book is is, a, is actually an amazing um, it's, 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 a, it's just a picture of their everyday lives full of little illustrations and um, 
and they and, and and they gave it to their parents and their grandmother who'd moved in with the family because she'd had to leave her home in Sheb because it was now occupied by Hitler. Uh, so they were there. And this uh, I'll give you a little, I can give you a little flavor of that book. Um, uh, uh, let's uh, just um, just a minute. That's not what I want. I'm gonna have to um, do this slightly differently. Yeah, sorry, I have to do this uh, like this. Um, this should do the trick. No, actually that one. Yeah, I know what I need to do. I apologize for this. I think I need to close. No, don't worry, I will open it from here. Can you now see? Um, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's good. I hope, can you, can, it's, a, it's a film now playing. Can you, can you see that? No, we, no, we can't see. You're it. not, that means that there's, uh, that's what I was a little afraid of. I shall, um, and meanwhile, actually, uh, there are some questions if the, the book is available, actually. Is the, book available? is the book available? We have some questions about. Yes, just a minute. I'll just try and, uh, so that I don't get completely um, confused. I'll just try and, I can't work out. Aha, this looks promising. The book is available. The book is published by a publisher it's called Triada. That's spelled T-R-I-A-D-A. -A. And if you go onto their website, which you'll very easily find, I think it's uh, itriada.org, I think is their address. Uh, and you look for Sancta Familia, you can find it there. You can order it uh, directly from the publishers. If you, I mean, I don't know if there's anybody listening to us because we're on, online, there might be somebody listening to us from the United Kingdom, uh, uh, in which case uh, you can, in, in Britain, you can order it through the Memorial Scro Scrolls Trust, uh, which has uh, its own e-shop, uh, uh, which is, uh, and you might even, you might also be able to order it actually to, to, be, to be shipped to Israel from from Britain, it might be easier than ordering it through the directly through the the publishers. Uh, but the book is available because the book has just come out as a as a facsimile edition okay. uh, with a with a translation. Because they wrote it in this delightful mixture of Czech and German, because uh, that's how they spoke in the family. Uh, and so we had to work out how to bring it out in a way that people could read it who don't speak uh, Czech German both Czech and German. So we found a way of doing it that always whatever language the, the original text is in, we have it a Czech translation on the opposite page and an English translation as well. So you can read the whole book in Czech, German and English. And there is also, we added, a, we added a, 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 an afterword at the end where I sort of tried to put the story into context. And uh, just to give you a taste, I think this will now work, I hope, of what the, uh, of what the, um, what the book, what the mood of the book, which is sort of, it's wonderfully humorous and entertaining. Here it is. Uh, I'll start, this, let me know immediately if it doesn't start playing. Yeah, we are here. Now. <laughs> it works. At some point, every sentence in this book has been spoken. That was our aim, to capture the little oddities of each of us and preserve them for all time. The little quirks. To set down every typical expression was quite impossible because new ones are constantly appearing and old ones disappearing. What will you have, Martin? A meatball? You bet. Get yourself one too, Mum. No. No, I really shouldn't. Here is a crown. I push my way through the crowd and return with a meatball. Hey, Mom, look how much onion she gave me. Have a bite. No, I'd better not.
Good morning, Mr. Wells. An amazing thing came to my mind during the night. Just look. If these countries were all to join forces and if Russia were to arm herself properly, then Germany couldn't move a muscle. That's what should be done. And you know when it came to me? At a quarter past three in the morning. Isn't it wonderful? It is wonderful. It is wonderful, and, uh, <laughs> and that, yeah, that's actually from because I made. I've, I've just finished making a uh, uh, a podcast series about the family, and, and we we enacted some of the scenes with uh, from the book uh, with actors, and it was great fun. And you can, I hope, it gives you a flavour of of how lively and and how lively the dialogue is, and what a sort of modern and 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 interesting family they were. Well, we, are, we call our event uh, Lost and Found Forgotten Fragments of Czech Jewish History of uh, the Czech Jewish Family, Family Wells. And we have some question uh, how uh, these fragments were were found. They were lost and fortunately, fortunately they were found. How, how, how did? That's a, I mean, that's a very actually moving story in itself. What happened is that Tomas, or Tomas escaped to Britain. His parents, uh, they were. They had good friends. They were very good friends with a, a Protestant pastor living in Prague, uh, in fact, just round the corner from the radio, uh, and uh, they visited them regularly during the during the period of the occupation. And when, as the, inevitably, the family knew it was going to happen, they were they received a letter summoning them to to the radio market from where they were sent to the Terezin ghetto, just before they left. They left a, a box, or possibly several boxes, uh, with all their most treasured sort of personal family items, with the family of this um, Protestant pastor called um, Josef Stifter, mm. and and they that the, and they never came back. They didn't come back from. They were murdered in in Auschwitz, uh, but the the their 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 the, as it were family archive or their personal these personal things, many I mean, hundreds of letters, photographs, all the photographs that, I've, that we were looking at a minute ago, they were all preserved in this box. Ironically, the building was one of the few buildings in Prague that received a direct hit during an allied uh, bombing raid in 1945, which is also slightly ironic because of course, Tomáš was actually serving in the Royal Air Force. <laughs> but um, luckily the box survived and most of the things were undamaged. And then, I mean, what happened was that Tomáš, immediately after the war, he didn't, he feared that his, his parents and his brother hadn't survived, but he wasn't sure. He came back as soon as he could to Prague, realized that his mother, father and brother had been murdered. He went to see the Stifter family and he took uh, as much of the stuff as he could possibly take with him back to Britain. By that time, he had a wife in, in England and a little, and a baby. Um, and then the Stifters sent on the rest later. Uh, but the thing is, I think it's something that's very sort of that happened very often. I mean, I think his trauma at losing his homeland, his family, his lang both his native languages, uh, his whole world was so great that uh, even though he had three children and an English wife, they oh, an Anglo-Irish wife, uh, they he never ever spoke to. Uh, the, his family, his children, about his past, and so it was kind of only it was up to his, particularly his son Colin, who who really rediscovered all these things. Everything, pretty much everything that we've been talking about, uh, is preserved in that box, and and it was a very gradual process. It began in the in the 1980s when, uh, just but another wonderful coincidence that Colin had a, a friend called Jerry Jerry Turner who 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 spoke Czech, and. And he translated. He translated Ubernatu, the um, the. Uh, yeah, I understand that the, the the box included another remarkable book. <laughs> I mean, that's again. I mean, I think. I mean, the, the book ended up being published after. It, first of all, in Sam is that, and then just after the fall of communism, and then again in nineteen in two thousand eleven, in an edition again by Triada, and this is this is the memoir of 
of Rudolf's grand of Rudolf's father, Rudolf the architect, and Collins, Colin in Britain, his great grandfather. And I can again, and it's the most beautiful. But he was a small shopkeeper, a very ordinary man. He was, he was. Uh, his family was one of several Jewish families who'd been living for centuries in this village in Western Bohemia. He had a little shop on the, on, on the village green, uh, but he was, I mean, he was just, an, he had a remarkable literary talent. And just before he died, he died in 1922, he wrote this amazing um, memoir. And I can play us uh, a bit of, um, uh, which again is just a reading, again taken from the podcast that, that, that we've just finished, okay. uh, from his memoir, uh, in, in, uh, and this is in Jerry Turner's uh, English translation. How I came to tell this story, at the request of my children, Rudolf and Inca and Otto. I sat down one quiet evening and started sorting through the memories of my own life and the life of my parents. I wrote down these fragments on scraps of paper or on clean pages torn out of my children's old exercise books. And one incident in my memory would call forth the one before and the one after. In just a few weeks, there was already a good handful of such scraps. My parents were very devout, and Papa was well versed in the law. He could spend hours with Mamma and me in contemplation of the Holy Scripture. And since he also enjoyed discoursing with Christians, he had a good knowledge of the New Testament too. His friends would often tell him what the Father had said in his sermon, and whenever there seemed anything not quite right about it, or if he thought the priest was mistaken, he would take down his copy of the New Testament and look it up for himself. Dogma exercised his mind most of all. No one was able to explain to him why the Virgin Mary was holy, and he never did find out. We kept the religious festivals in proper style. Our favourite, as children, was Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, which we called under the greenery. The synagogue stood two doors away from our house. It was quite a large roomy building with some 80 seats for the menfolk and a large gallery along its west side for the women. Around the walls on all sides were benches with numbered places in front of which were stands for the prayer books. The eastern wall contained a cupboard of four Torahs behind a curtain known as the Peroches. In the middle of the room was a raised area surrounded by a low wall where the Torah was read. We all washed. Mama would wash as little ones. We men of the family would dress up. When we came home from the service, Papa would bless us all, laying both his hands on our heads and saying the Hebrew blessing, Yevarech Echo Adonai. I sought among these memories as one does when raking over the dying embers in a stove and I observe just how eventful and interesting can be the life of even the least and most lowly of human beings. For many years, my life to outside gaze appeared monotonous, but I am grateful for it to the great providence. And remember, my dears, those of you who will be the continuation of my life, there is no light without shade. And there is no night so dark that it is not followed by the dawning of a new day. And uh, that illust illustration there on the cover of the book is was by um, his grandson Martin, who also illustrated you know this wonderful book at the age of thirteen. Uh, the book, ironically, I mean, it's a strange irony in the fact that the memoir only survived because uh, during, at the beginning of the occupation, uh, the German occupation, Rudolf, Shimon's son, was no longer allowed to work as an architect. And Ida said to him, you know, to stop you going completely mad, uh, why don't you, you know, transcribe your dad's memoir and put it all in order because it was all on scraps of paper. And so that's why the book, uh, that's why the book survived. Uh, 
uh, and was preserved. But tragically, um, you know, I mean, it's so it's so tragic when you see how um, also how optimistic Shimon was for the future of his family. You know that, you know, that there's no you know there's no night so dark that you don't that, that, that there isn't light. The sun doesn't come up the next day. It, when you think of what happened to the family, it's 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 heartbreaking. Uh, and they'd been in they'd been in the village in that village in West Bohemia for for many many generations, probably since the 16th century. Um, and uh, and you can see the humour. I love the humour. I mean, that's, those were those were sort of that was a that was a collage of extracts from 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 Shimon's memoir, and you can see that there's a sense of humour there. And also many things that are typically Czech, like the the his attitude towards the. Uh, the, the Catholic Church, for example, is is typically Czech over the second half of the 19th century. So, so he's looking at it not just from the sort of Jewish perspective, but also from a typically Czech perspective, like being very skeptical about the about the, the Catholic hierarchies. Uh, great, David. We have sort of a question. Uh, many people ask actually about the, the about the postcard uh, po podcast about uh, if you can show the link to the postcard, you need to get it. Yes, what I can do share I can, the, the link because I, yeah. many people are interested actually, so which is great. Uh, I shall show it to you. I can open it. Uh, that's not what it's meant to be showing. Just a minute. Um, uh, that's just a minute. I shall try this another way. Um, I don't know why it's not coming up because I've got the. I see what's happened. Just one moment. Anyway, we will definitely, yeah. I yeah. shall, here it is. I shall open this. This should now, um, if I go back to here, yeah, share screen. Um, there we have it. You Can you now see it? The podcast. Can you now see the radio? This is the this is the this is the podcast at, at home, as it were, on the website of Radio Prague International. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I was very delighted that they commissioned it from me. What I did, I I put together in seven parts the story of the family, and I was very keen to tell the story of the Vals family, really from from back in rural. The village where Shimon came from right up to the present day, I was very keen for them to tell the story in their own words. And of course, it means that, uh, that, that, that you know, I, I draw from all these books, the two books and from the letters and everything that survives in the, the miraculously in this family archive. And I tried to put them together so that really the family members could tell their own story. And those who are alive today as well, I went to see Colin and we actually we had a wonderful experience of sort of going through the different different things that are in that are in his various boxes at home and uh, and um, and it was great it was it was it was very moving it's very moving for Colin in particular because of course his family history was he was cut off completely from his family history so so uh, he's really been very only very gradually with the help of lots of other people who are enthusiasts, I have to say, who have helped him to sort of to put piece the bits together. And I did it in this uh, podcast, which is, uh, which is where, the, where, where we have the letters and the scenes from the book, we've dramatized them. And otherwise it's also with documentary elements where, you know, Colin talks about going back to the village where his ancestors came from. He talks about, you know what it means to him. For example, there are even postcards that survive that his parents, his his grandparents, were able to send to a friend um, from the family camp in Auschwitz. And it's there's something very, very strange and very moving about reading these postcards. Really, the last, the last messages from his from his grandparents. So he put it together. Um, uh, here are the episodes. It's going out at the moment. We've got as far as episode six, but it's all, of course, available on you know also through also also through um, uh, and Spotify I, I, and Apple Podcasts, etc. And then at the bottom, so because the story is quite complicated and there are lots of different generations, I've also got a little little potted biographies of the main 
characters who are who, or members of the family who figure going right, right back to Josefina Lurvy, who is Colin's great great grandmother who walked over 200 miles in order to get a special dispensation so that she could marry the man she loved in defiance of of anti-semitic austro-hungarian <laughs> legislation of the time or austrian legislation of the time uh, and then there's shimon there's rudolf uh, the architect Ida, his wife who was a very very strong character personality uh, Tomasz, who survived, Martin, who was such an incredibly gifted young artist, but perished in, in, in Auschwitz, and then Colin, uh, who was born in after the war and lives in, in, in Oxford, in, in Britain, and he's the person who has all the, all, all the archive, and, um, and Jerry is uh, his, his Colin's good friend, who, as I say, by a wonderful coincidence, is, uh, speaks fluent Czech. Uh, and Michal Rund, I should mention, is he's he's a historian. He's the head director of the museum in in Sokolov, in the town where where Rudolf worked in in the twenties. And he's written a fantastic um, monograph about about Rudolf Vels, which is really really about his Rudolf Vels the architect, which is which is an excellent book. Currently out of print, frustratingly, but let's hope we can get it out again. Marta Holekova is the granddaughter of Josef Stifter, the priest who, um, with whom the, the, the things were preserved in, in, in Prague. And it's a very moving story how she's again become friends with the, uh, with the, 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 the Wells family. And there's a kind of a link between you know, the Czech Republic and, 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 and Britain that has been, that has been recreated. I'm, the author and narrator of the, of the podcast and then I also because I wanted to everything I wanted everything in the podcast to be to be for want of a better word I suppose authentic and I didn't have any because of course uh, the the family weren't able to send anything from the from the radio market where they were kept where they had to wait in, in, in human conditions before being sent to the ghetto because I didn't have any anything from them that they themselves had said or written. I actually went to see two, um, one, well, one uh, old lady, Lisa Mikova, who is still alive, born in 1922, who was in the same transport uh, to Terezin as, um, as the Wells family. And she, and so I, I asked her about, you know, she talked about what the, the, the awful conditions and, 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 and that particular part of the, the story of the family, which, which, which we don't have preserved through letters or through other things that they wrote or said, uh, and um, yeah, there was also an exhibition I put together. You can, if, if anybody who's interested, can actually follow a, a link uh, to a YouTube virtual tour of the exhibition, which consists mostly of things from from the boxes that survive in Oxford. Um, and then there's an event that we did with the uh, with the Czech Center in London, which also in where you can also meet, uh, which is also on YouTube, and you can meet uh, Colin and his brother Ivan. We definitely publish yeah, this link of, on our on our sites as well. Of course, uh, the Radio Prague, Czech Radio Prague, uh, is a very important part of Czech centers, of course. And uh, David Morgan uh, works there. David, who has been living so, for so many years in Czech Republic. 30 years, 30 years. 30 years, and, and, and you speak fluently Czech as well. I, with an accent, with a horrible English <laughs> yeah, accent. I would, I, would, I, would, I would say. So, David, thank you very much for your tremendous work. Uh, well, really thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I've been waffling on for well over an hour. So, uh, <laughs> really I appreciate that. And, uh, and thank all the audience and uh, what's even better. So it's uh, possible to, to, to watch in coming days uh, because uh, this event was recorded. So, so everybody who's interesting can, uh, can see and watch uh, later in coming days. David, thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And greetings to Israel from the Czech Republic. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Take care. All the best. Bye. Bye.